Hello and a happy new year to all Hurley Burleyites out there. 2020 is going to be a hell of a year. I can feel it. Do you make resolutions? I usually don't because I can't keep them. But this year I thought to myself, self, why not make a few modest attainable resolutions that'll help me be a better person? Number one, watch Caddyshack at least eight more times this year. That'll bring my total to 271 viewings since 1980. So I've got that going for me, which is nice. Number two, absolutely cut out eating anything from Cinnabon until maybe mid-February. Then reassess this resolution. And on a more serious note, continue to make good quality podcasts with my friends Jenny and Scott that connect with our listeners on meaningful issues we care about. Speaking of, our presenting sponsor, TELUS, is working hard to address digital connectivity with their All Connected for Good programs, Mobility for Good, Internet for Good, Tech for Good, and Health for Good. That's a lot of for good. These four programs help ensure that all Canadians, regardless of their location or circumstances, have access to the technology and resources they need. In fact, TELUS has donated more than $1.2 billion in the communities where they operate since 2000, and they're just getting started. To learn more about how TELUS helps us stay all connected for good, go to connectingcanadaforgood.ca. Now, ladies and gentlemen, hello, it's David Hurley here, and welcome to the first 2020 edition of the Hurley Burley. Welcome, Jenny. Happy New Year. And welcome, Scott. Happy New Year. Yep. It's a pristine new decade. We're back with Jenny and Scott. Pristine? They're smart. They're funny. <laughs> They're sweary. And one of them wears tight leather pants. Scott, stop it. It uh, doesn't uh, work. <laughs> you do not understand how many whistles I get. <laughs> so it's been suggested that we ought to come up with a better name for our Jenny Scott pa- episodes than the generic political panel. And that is an excellent idea. And we are crowdsourcing. Could be the argumentarians. Could be the auto whiners. Or we could go all dramatic and call it Libcon 2. Prepare for war. What about just plain old Scott and Jenny? But sing it like Gordon Lightfoot's Cotton Jenny. Actually, if you wonderful Hurley Burley listeners out there have suggestions to name our political panel, please send them along. I promise we'll pick the best one, and the winner will receive a previously loved but beautiful laundered Hurley Burley t-shirt. Scott and Jenny, let's get at it. Welcome to 2020. Scott. Yep. Harry and Megan took some time off over oh, Christmas, man. and they decided they wanted to make some big changes in their life. Justin Trudeau took some time off over the holidays. He grew a beard. Have you come up with any big changes in your life over the holidays? Well, I'm going to step away from my non-royal duties. I mean, I've been thinking about it. And, uh, like, I'll be 52 in a couple months, and I think it's time for me to explore this notion of being financially independent. Um, <laughs> what the hell? Right? I'm a little worried, right? I mean, I want to... And I'm not going to go all out. I'm going to continue to serve and support Her Majesty the Queen. And I will, of course, assume some responsibilities. And I like that big cottage we have uh, in Scotland. But, you know, I'm, 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 I'm thinking it through. I'm thinking, uh, thinking some change is good, yeah. You? Are you a monarchist like all good conservatives? I am. I am a monarchist. I'm very – Harry is my favorite royal, and right. I just feel he's been led astray. Oh, awesome. Okay, so you're like a <laughs> Megan hater. You're, you're like – she is – she's you're part of the family Yoko, up. You're part of the Yoko-fication I, I, of I, Meghan Markle. I I, I, I am. I, 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 he just – he she, he seems he, – he estranged from his brother. They had all these charities together, and now they don't have these charities together. They're estranged. Together. How do people make these assertions? People, I mean, do we know they, that they're not talking? Or, I well, mean, just because the goddamn son in Britain says that, is it true? Well, she, they're stepping away. Well, they're not doing charities together anymore. It's a natural division. I mean, look, we're close as brothers. But if I was going to be the king, you would eventually drift away. I think that's right. Yeah. I think that's right. Mm. Although if you were going to be the king, I think I might invite you to someplace high <laughs> and encourage you to take a good long look over the edge. <laughs> So Trudeau grew a beard, and people uh, on Twitter didn't know whether it was news or not news. And well, I'll if it's on Twitter, it has to be news. It has to be news. I'll, I'll start by saying I think it's somewhat news, just because I don't think Justin Trudeau does anything that impacts on his appearance without considerable thought and deliberation and without purpose. Or it could be simply he just grew a beard over the holidays and liked the look of it. Yeah. 
What are these makeovers? You're too young to remember when Preston Manning got contacts, aren't you? Uh, no, I, I remember it quite well. He got he got laser eye surgery. He got laser eye surgery and got rid of glasses. Yeah. Right? And his hair got his, his hair got buttered right to the edge. His hair, remember his hair got beautiful. It lost its part. It just became sort he of He got his teeth fixed, started started wearing those cool denim shirts in the mid nineties. So on. how does it work when leaders change their images when they're already well established what they're supposed to look like? You know, I it works or it doesn't work. I, I, for Trudeau, first of all, let's be honest about it. Um, it's an extension of his existing personality insofar as he's hot. Man, that beard is hot. He's good looking with that beard. Eh? Significantly I better say, than either yours. I, 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 I like the beard. I, it's, I dig it, man. It's got a little gray in it, so it gives him is a little gravitas. Is it what you were going for? No, no, David, you <laughs> you misunderstand. My, my, I have, I have a Chris Pratt sort of sexy sparseness to me. Um, that's what me and my beard are going for. Um, and I like green chicks like like Chris Pratt and like Kirk. Um, but you know, no, I think Trudeau. I think he's. I think he's growing a beard. I think he liked it. Um, I think you know we have to ask ourselves. Is he going through some sort of revolutionary personal change? Is something else going like that? Is he going to alter the way in which he conducts himself and government affairs? But I find the fascination uh, with his beard actually just an extension of the fact that we are, and, and I think this is undeniable, we're uniquely fascinated by Trudeau because he is our first celebrity prime minister and a large portion of that celebrity factor is driven not just by his surname, but by his matinee good looks. Like he's atypically good looking for a politician. And I think the beard. Politics normally known as show business for ugly people. Exactly. Yeah. And, and he's, <laughs> he's just freaking good looking. And I think the beard makes him even more handsome. I love the beard. I'm all over the beard. Look what it's done for me. Yeah, well, you see, I think though, I'm just going to close on this. I think he may have grown it incidentally, but he likes it for a reason. And I think that he likes it for the same reason that you and I grew our beards. It adds gravitas to us. It makes Absolutely. us look more serious, more credible. You For got, sure. You got no idea the way people treat me now. I know. It's they a, step aside when I walk down the street. <laughs> <laughs> They're scared of you when you walk down the street. Um, Jenny, you were uh, at, uh, in a uh, prime minister's office that had to deal with a co international conflict situation. Yep. The war in Iraq was on the almost entire time that you were in. Well, we were in Afghanistan. It's sorry, it, Afghanistan. Yeah. I'm sorry, Afghanistan. We were, they, it was yeah. the uh, it, it, the longest uh, longest war. In our history, it was, it was the same amount as the First and Second World Wars uh, combined. Right, right. Were you surprised in any way by the way the U.S. strike on uh, in Iraq on on the Iranian um, official? Were you surprised by how that went down in terms of its relationship with Canada at all? Um, no, not re not really. I, I yeah. think that um, I I don't really think it. I think where we come in now, like how, how it's affected, we obviously have troops on the ground, um, troops there. Yeah. Um, uh, but it's, it, it, I think it's more timely now with the plane crash that happened yesterday in yeah. Iran and, and 63 uh, Canadians, uh, uh, Canadians died. So I think that there's so much speculation. The prime minister was out yesterday and when asked, uh, could this have been an act of terrorism or could this have been a missile? He, he wouldn't say no and neither did uh, – Neither did Mark Garneau when he was. It almost sounded like Garneau that. thought it was. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. And there and and, and oh, no it's one's damn suspicious. Yeah. Won't release the black boxes. Won't permit any kind of an international investigation. Will handle it on their own. And now they say, whoopsies! It turns out the black boxes have damage, and uh, and data missing. Yeah. Right. I mean, come on. Right. Like the the only thing they've they've come out with today is there's a video that shows. It, the plane attempted to uh, at least look like it was turning around um, before it ended up it ended up crashing. Right. I mean, I, I'm not nearly as expert as either of you because I was never in the office when this kind of thing was never in a prime minister's office. But I, I would have thought we'd get a heads up, especially since we got troops in the area. No. No, no, you I would not have expected that we no. would get a heads up. Okay, no. I, 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 don't think so. There'd be, there would be no reason to, uh, to give us, to give us a heads up. They, we would might hear about it after the fact, um, uh, before it hit the news. But mm. there was gonna, like, there was gonna be no way we were, uh, we were told. Like, I remember being on a plane, uh, out to Calgary on uh, the night before the 2011 election and landing, and that's when we found out that, um, the Americans had gotten Osama bin Laden. Right. 
but I, I don't think we would have gotten a heads up. But we would work, like, for the plane crash, for example, th this is something now we're all going to be working, because we had, of course, Canadians on the plane crash when Russia shot down the plane in, in uh, uh, over Ukraine, um, because I was in the prime minister's office for that. And it was a, a big file that we, uh, that we had, we were paying very close attention to what was happening, what was happening there. Right. Okay. So is, um, is the unilateral approach of this, um, I mean, given that previous administrations went to some <laughs> level to get international alignment and cooperation when they were, mucking about in the Middle East and second George Bush didn't get all of it that he wanted, but they at least tried to get some international buy-in and cooperation. Trump sort of talked about NATO after, but is this sort of a natural extension of the United States becoming more and more unilateral and less and less tied to giving a shit whether you, what the UN or what NATO thinks? I, about I, I don't think so. I, I don't think we should look at the one him taking out, um, uh, him taking out, uh, I would say his name wrong, but yeah. him taking out the terrorist, um, uh, is it Suleiman like Neil Diamond says it? So, so Su Suleiman. Is it like that? I don't. Sh I thought it was Suleimani. I thought it was Suleimani. Suleimani? Okay, Suleimani. all right. Um, I mean, Suleimani. we're revealing our ignorance. But, right? but, yeah. but, but, but I, I don't think I think that that was a that was one action that he, of course, would not have uh, would not have. Uh, shared, but that doesn't mean the Americans aren't looking for cooperation or they're not looking uh, for their allies uh, as to what's going to happen uh, now uh, in Iran and the uh, Americans' relationship with them. Right. What do you folks think might be requested of Canada in this circumstance? Well, I, I just want to, I want to go back one step. I, I think the answer to your question, am I surprised by the way Trump has handled this, is yes and no. Um, I agree with Jenny. It was a covert strike. And you don't, you can if you're planning a mission of that sort, a strike of that kind, um, well, it's all based on intelligence and surprise, and you're not going to tell 25 people in advance or 30 allies in advance and expect that you're going to be able to execute it without something going um, astray. So that makes sense to me. Um, I was most troubled by the half-assed cavalier mention of NATO in Trump's remarks. To me, that's a puzzle. No conditioning in advance, ap apparently no phone calls to foreign leaders, NATO countries, where he's saying, I'm going to be mentioning NATO. I'd like to invoke NATO in uh, the aftermath of this. So that was not done, and it should have been done if he was going to invoke NATO. And secondly, in the time that we've had since the speech, we have no, particularly no particular elaboration as to what the hell he meant by that. And so I think that is an example of the incompetence and the half-assedness of uh, the Trump administration, uh, and that and, and and that worries me because it suggests that they have a notion that there needs to be some sort of ongoing uh, regime management, something happening in the Middle East. They think that allies ought to be involved, but it's undefined. It was not advanced, and so you know, what do you do with that? Um, and to say nothing of the fact that he spent. Um, you know, the past three years shitting all over NATO and doing his goddamn just to dismantle the thing and undermine it. Um, what do we expect? I, I, I think that we should look to see whether or not it's actually an opportunity, given his track record, for NATO to reassert its value and reassert itself. Um, I'm actually, in a weird way, I'm not happy about turmoil and conflict, but I'm happy for the opportunity for NATO um, to position itself again as the incredibly vital military alliance that it is. So um, watch for what the expectations are, what the NATO allies are willing to do. Um, but you know, when it comes to the Middle East, it's the same rule over and over again. Don't Jenny, get in don't unless you know how to get out. Go ahead. What were you no, say? but if, if but if the allies are going to if if NATO countries want to have a say in this stuff, they actually have to step up. The Amer the Americans do the vast majority of of the heavy lifting and. Uh, that has been Trump's point in terms of going after uh, countries like Canada uh, to put— to, It hasn't to, been his sole point. He's been utterly disrespectful and neglectful. Of, he hasn't just said, increase your dues. He said, increase your dues, and NATO doesn't matter. And, I mean, the, the support that he's showing for Putin and what's happened in Crimea, I mean— yeah, all of this, to me, undermines NATO and the integrity of the alliance. So now he says, maybe I need NATO. I guess we should be grateful for that. But, you know, it's a contradiction of his own conduct and, and rhetoric. Wouldn't you be, don't, don't give me Trump derangement syndrome here. Wouldn't you be reluctant? Wouldn't you be reluctant as a country to throw your lot in with him being as unpredictable, mercurial, 
is yes. Do you believe this was a wag the dog thing? Is this a real thing or was this an actual impeachment offset? I don't think he was wagging. Measure. I don't think he was wagging the dog. This the the the, the Pentagon has said that uh, they had intelligence reports that he was Kassam. How do we say his name again? Um, uh, he uh, was planning attacks uh, on uh, Western targets, which were American soldiers. We know that uh, he, that IEDs in Iraq uh, that have that have and, and anti tank um, uh, anti tank uh, missiles uh, have been provided to. Uh, have been provided by Iran that, that 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 strike against American troops. So I don't think it was a I don't think it was a wag the dog thing at all. No, I'm not so sure. I think it could be both. Um, uh, I did not find their arguments for the uh, urgency of this strike uh, particularly compelling, um, but they weren't very detailed. So how do you evaluate um, uh, uh, their validity? Um, what I do know is when it comes to Trump, you can't believe anything he says. You can't believe what any government says in a time of war to be candid, right? That pr principle has been proven over and over and over again since time of memorial. But you can't believe Trump on the little things, much less the big things. Second, you can't, you, you can't evaluate his motives uh, like you would someone else because his motives are always perverted. Um, and you can't rely on his judgment. So, you know, it makes it, uh, inherently a fuck show when it comes to him. And this is what you do worry about in terms of a fit, fitness to be commander-in-chief. All right, guys, we're going to stop for a moment and take a break from our sponsor. When we come back, we will talk about where the government of Canada is. <clears throat> Ontario realtors live and breathe their communities. They're connected to the people, places, and things that make their neighborhoods tick. But why do they do it? That's easy. Building stronger communities is part of realtors' DNA. It's the people and places that drive them to be civic leaders, ambassadors, and builders. The Ontario Real Estate Association is proud to support Ontario's 80,000 realtors and all that they do to build stronger communities. Go to realtorscareontario.ca to learn more. All right, Scott, Jenny, when we um, first met <laughs> after uh, the government uh, was re-elected and had stated its intention to take a little bit of time off before it was sworn in and <coughs> reconfigured. We all thought that was a smart idea, recalibrate, etc. Then when we met in Ottawa before Christmas to do the live show, I said, hey, it's getting a bit long, isn't it, this uh, period of reflection? And you both thought I was panicking a little bit. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and that, you know, Scott was particularly of the view that... Uh, uh, no news was good news at that point in time. But now we're another month later. And uh, even Paul Wells is getting twitchy about it. Oh, and <laughs> even Paul Wells. Even Paul wow. Wells has reached into his bag of insults to fling one out the Prime Minister. Oh, what a fucking startling development. <laughs> anyway... Uh, is this still a, an appropriate period of recalibration or is this a sign that the government either doesn't have anything urgent to do or can't decide what's urgent to do? Well, like I'm not, I'm not trying to, to defend the government, but it is, it is. Go ahead. It's lovely. When you yeah. Do. Yeah. Um, I, it is, uh, I, it is January. The house will be back at the end of, uh, at the end of this month. Um, just because they're not out doing public announcements doesn't mean the work of government isn't being isn't being done. They did have a uh, a very large uh, uh, a very large they, they they had a shuffle which I know we did a whole uh, episode on. Freeland's and, been meeting with people. I see that in the news. Yeah, apparently. he's been meeting with people, and I'm assuming he had briefings yesterday on the situation on the plane crash, for example, because he and Garneau were both out, and I saw that he was meeting with. Uh, uh, Sajan, so he was. They were in town. I, 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 I don't think it doesn't mean the government's working. We're just not seeing. We're seeing a very different uh, government. We are not seeing. It continues to be a, a diametrically different uh, approach by the prime minister, who was front and center and doing all the fluffy stuff. So we're not seeing that. So there is no. There is no fluffy stuff. Uh, he's he's seemingly releasing pictures. He's getting briefings. He's doing. The so only you don't think this is a break? You think this is the <laughs> new normal? I think that it's the new normal for now. I, I I don't think it's a I don't think it's a break, and I don't begrudge him or any other politicians taking holidays at 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 at, at Christmas time. Um, I think this they have made a decision from October twenty second onwards uh, to just do things very differently, and it's going it's a different pro it's it is a it is not the 
happy, you know, um, happy-go-lucky, uh, you know, fun Bobby type uh, person uh, as prime minister. He's he's being serious. He's grown the beard. Yeah. He's mm-hmm. looking reflective. You think this is the new normal, Scott? Uh, probably. Um, I mean, it will express itself differently when the House is back in session, and therefore you'll see the prime minister more often. But I think, you know, a couple things. First, this is a reminder of how intertwined in this day and age our assessment of government in Canada has become linked to um, our uh, eyeballs on the prime minister. Okay? What's really changed? The, the business of government, we all know, we've worked in government, right? Briefings are happening, ministers are staffing up, work is going on, right? Freeland's doing meetings, other ministers, it's less high profile and less visible, they're doing meetings with counterparts and so on and so forth. So the the operations of government are occurring. All of that is happening. Wait a second, Scott. Yeah. This is a government in which no minister could breathe without approval from the PMO, right, in the previous four years. Now you're saying that these people are free and off and doing important work with no supervision I'm whatsoever? Saying well, I'm not saying no supervision. I'm <clears throat> saying that it's not particularly different than any other month of the past X number of years, not just the past four years, but under the Trudeau administration. I'm saying under the past number of years under any government. They, the minister's off doing stuff, right? And when the House is not in session, that's been occurring. Yeah, there was a Christmas break. But beyond that, this is actually normal. What's different, what is uh, visibly different is the absence of the prime minister all right, we've seen him twice. We saw him yesterday in response to uh, the downing of the plane. Yeah. And we saw a photograph of him uh, yeah. over the holidays drinking in a laundromat with his beard, <laughs> right? Like that's 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 all we've seen of him, okay? And I do not begrudge him drinking in a laundromat because what I'm certain- What are your favorite places? It's absolutely my favorite place, right? <laughs> I've been known to dry my clothes twice so I could finish the gin. Um, but, you know, so I think that's what's going to last. I think that they've decided to treat him as a political commodity in a different way in this new term than in the previous one. And I think it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. It's easy to do it in this holiday break season when the House isn't in session over the holidays. How does it express itself in March, April? Do we see more prominence of other ministers? Um, Will he continue uh, to be modest in his choices in terms of how apparent and upfront he is. I think that's what's going to be interesting. But do I get exercised about it in the Paul Wells way? Oh my God, the government is gone. We need a government. Oh, fuck off. No. No? All right. The government's there. So he's, um, that will require um, A, an extraordinary amount of discipline on his part and their part because, on his part, because it seems to me that his idea of the reason he's a celebrity is because he's always wanted to be in the public eye. He's always wanted to be the center of attention. He's always wanted to. Um, and as prime minister, he wanted to be very visible. Um, and um, I think it's been their inclination as an office, which it always is, certainly was a mistake I think we made with with Wynne uh, over time, was to throw the leader at everything and to yep. throw the prime minister at everything and put them in the circumstance. You can make an argument that this is going to work for him just because people don't want so much politics in their life. I mean, I think one of the things that's to people that Trump irritates, one of the things that is irritating is that he's in your face every day. The politics is in your life every day. People don't want that much politics. They don't want the government to be around but, all that much. But I, I, I agree. Uh, people, people do want less government in their, in their, uh, in their face. I think with, I think with Trudeau, he made a, we saw a much different, and we've talked about this before. We saw a much different Trudeau after the story uh, broke during the election campaign uh, with blackface. And I'm not sure he fully ever recovered from that. He, he Listen, he survived that story. So you think he's tra- traumatized a little bit? Is I that, think he's traumatized. Honestly, is that what you mean? I honestly think he's a That's bit traumatized by it. And I think that his celebrity is what I think saved him. I think that almost uh, uh, no politician, and we talked about this, any politician running for any party other than the Prime Minister of Canada would have been um, uh, would have been removed uh, as a candidate would have been removed, and we never we'd be talking about them in ten years. Going, we've right. never seen this guy, no. and so I think his celebrity saved him. Uh, I think he was traumatized by uh, uh, by that and never fully recovered. So we'll see if it we'll see if it continues. Right. But it's it's going to be harder. Like to Scott's point. Uh, House is back on the last week of of January. There's going to be more need for the prime minister. He's going to have to be a bit more uh, front and center. He'll have to be in question period a few times a week. Like, um, 
so so we'll we'll see if it continues. But I I don't think we will ever see um, uh, the the Justin Trudeau that we did before the 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 fun party going like playboy uh, celebrity. I I think that is I think that will be gone for the rest of his and not just career. tactically or as a tactic, but as a reality of who he is. I don't think is. it's a tactic. I think he I think they might be. I, listen, I think he he's he's trying to look more serious. It's a minority government. He got wiped out in the prairies. Um, I, you know, there are consequences to policies that um, that they, the government has made, and that's what happened in the prairies. But I, I think he has made the personal decision to, uh, to to take a different tack. That's my that's my opinion. I'm watching it. Right? I'm not asking. I think that's really interesting. I, I candidly, I hadn't thought about it. Um, admittedly, I never have any sort of um, psychological impulse whatsoever, so I didn't think about it from that perspective. Um, and that's an interesting analysis. Um, I'm not convinced, though. Like, I, I mean, I, I think that it's, I, 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 until proven otherwise, I'm going to assume that it's a strategic move, not just a tactical one, but a strategic move. And um, I do not believe, regardless of what the motivation is, that it in any way impairs his ability as prime minister. Like, just because he doesn't spend his capital daily doesn't mean that his authority and his ability to command the stage is diminished in any way, shape, or form. Um, and I think that when and if he chooses to intervene and be the loudest voice in the room, he will be always. Uh, and so I just think it, like, I think it's smart. I see no reason to criticize it. I just can't see a downside to it right now. Right. It leaves space for ministers to emerge. Well, and and they already have, you know, Christian Freeland is the minister of everything, seemingly. Yeah. And yesterday, Garneau commented on, uh, yep. um, uh, Garneau commented on the plane, the plane crash. Yeah. And I'd actually, that's the first time I remember hearing him comment on anything. Yeah, in the way that he broke through the clutter because yep. Trudeau wasn't all over it. Yeah. No. Right. No. Right. So they may have some ministers emerge. At least there's an opportunity for ministers to emerge. That would be or at least public. Like I, 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 I'm, I, I still maintain. I agree with Scott. I think how Justin Trudeau is, com com like how he's acting, is probably the exact same way internally that he did. But what we are seeing is Justin Trudeau is not going jogging for the sake of going jogging, so the press can, can see him, like you know, tweet out a picture and and you know, thumbs up. He's we are mm -hmm. we are seeing a more serious cerebral. And, and don't underestimate the importance of a shift to minority. I know that this is an extremely stable minority. We've all said that it's conventional wisdom that this minority exists until and unless the liberal government decides yes. that it doesn't want it to. Um, but nevertheless, it's a minority government. And I think the idea of saying, you know, um, it introduces an inherent level of unpredictability into governing. And as a consequence, every spot on the horizon, right, could be a cloud that fades or it could be a bullet that hits me. And and so I think having the prime minister be the first and largest target constantly makes less sense in a minority, and this makes more sense. It appears the longer time goes on, it appears that they're not going to attempt to replace Gerald Butts with an equivalent type of person as the principal secretary in that office. There was talk that Marc-Andre Blanchard might become the principal secretary. There were other names that were bandied about, but none of that seems to have happened. So um, it seems to me like Butts leaves um, a pretty substantial intellectual void at the center of the government. What do you expect to fill that? Well, listen, but every staffing dynamic is going to be is going to be different because it's based on different personalities uh, that that you have that you have in there, and and a chief of staff and a principal secretary and director of communications. We all like they're usually people that uh, have much have different skill sets. They bring different things to the table, um, uh, and depending on on what they were. Like when I was in the prime minister's office. Uh, as deputy chief of staff, I was not a policy wonk. I had policy files that that I I cared about more than others. Uh, but at the end of the day, I'm more going to be giving looking at a political lens. I'm a type A personality. There was always, uh, you know, uh, that's the direction that that's the what I brought to uh, brought to the table. I wasn't going to sit and write a eight page policy paper um, on on different issues. There were very smart people around that 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 did that did that. So. Um, I, I don't know. It's 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 it. They're going to have to d decide, Katie and and the Prime Minister, what the vacuum is, how they want to restructure the restructure the office. I assume maybe that's what they're working on. But 
you know, when you lose a senior person like like Jerry. Um, Who was more than a senior staffer. Yes. More of an alter ego than a senior staffer. I would argue that there's never been a person like him in a prime minister's office. And so, therefore, the departure leaves an unusually large hole. Yeah, that's probably fair. But I, but they're going to have to restructure the office to see how what works for the prime minister going going forward. Right. I don't know the answer to your question. I think it's um, one of the two or three big questions that are kicking around Ottawa. Like if you go uh, to have a beer with people in Ottawa, this is what people talk about, um, you know. And so it's one of the things that people talk about. And I think that if things go well for this government, um, then there'll be lots of answers to the question. PCO may step up. Um, one or two ministers like Christio or maybe others. Um, other staffers, it may, uh, you know, we may see um, lots of other staffers. Uh, we could name some of them that that that, that will start to fill uh, space. Um, if it goes badly, uh, then the question is going to come back in a serious way. And it will be interesting to see how they respond. Like if the government appears to be dysfunctional and can't uh, manage things, then um, then people will point to that as a cause, whether it is or it isn't, you know, like people yeah. will do that ex post facto analysis of it. Um, I, I'm not sure we apply the analysis that you just voiced. Um, this is a atypical circumstance, atypical government, uh, atypical PMO, and as a consequence, it leaves an atypical vacuum. I'm not sure that the PMO feels that way. Okay. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure that they uh, would share that analysis. Uh, my bet is that that would, would be delusional. Um, my bet is that they'd be eager to demonstrate that that analysis is um, is invalid and uh, and need not be prophetic. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's see how they go on that. So, shifting topics. I'm gonna look at you. <laughs> I know where this is going. I'm gonna look at you. Um, I have, through the course of the conversations I've had over the last month or so, gone from believing that. Pierre Poilievre was an implausible candidate for the leadership of the Conservative Party to believing that he is likely the frontrunner uh, for the leadership of the Conservative Party based on what appears to be very substantial on the ground network and organization of which <coughs> you are a part, correct? If Pierre decides to run, I've been very public. I, I, I have committed to him if he runs that right. I, will, uh, I will support him. Right. So – Given that, and that's cool, and we're going to continue to have this thing, and we're yep. just going to accept that that's the that's the reality. I of should our mention that I'm working for Rana, um, <laughs> <laughs> just so the conflicts are off the table. I should mention that nobody asked me to work in politics anymore. <laughs> <laughs> It, listen, it's going to be an. What is the case for Pierre Polyev? Can you take us through the argument <laughs> for why he's the best choice? Well, I think Pierre is. Uh, he is a. Very intelligent. Uh, uh, he's a very intelligent guy. He is uh, uh, probably our best performer in uh, in Parliament. Um, he has he spent ten years uh, uh, handling files for our government um, that uh, uh, that were very tough for us. He's he's he he is a very effective. He is a message machine. You you're looking at me. You're fucking right. I'm looking at you. <laughs> okay, I just got to ask. Okay, in all honesty. Right, and I know that people say, "Oh, well, you know, liberals." I don't underestimate the guy. I, I recognize his talents. He is an effective communicator. Um, but I got to say, in all honesty, um, I didn't find him implausible as a candidate. But I'm astonished that he has emerged so rapidly, so con so consistently in terms of analysis as the front runner, as the I'm not sure if he's as a I'm descendant sure. to Harper, and and. Uh, you know, to me, I just got to ask you, like, what the fuck? Like, I don't see it. And I'm sorry. I don't mean to be rude about him. I recognize that the guy is talented. But here's how I've seen him over the years. And yep. I've observed him closely. Um, a hatchet man. He's the guy that you send out, you put on a political panel who will not vary from talking points, who will put the others on defense, and who will swing a bat and hit you in the head. And I've never seen him associated with a single big idea. I've not seen him associated with anything other than partisan gain. And I'm not trying to be partisan, but in all honesty, I've never seen him do anything other than partisan. And I don't get the breadth of his appeal. Will we see a different guy in the leadership race than we've seen to date? Because I don't see how the guy to date has established himself as the front runner. I, I, and a potential maybe prime this minister. is an opportunity for you to continue your 
argument for Pierre Polio okay, that you were yeah. in the middle of before he. Um, <laughs> I just can't contain myself. I'm sorry, and I'm not trying to be rude, but I just don't fucking All get right, it. All right, let her go, Jesus. Pierre, Pierre is. <laughs> if you go back, Pierre's led major policy files for our government. Well, we were in government, and over the last four years in opposition as the as the finance critic, he he was the main uh, point of uh, of. Uh, communication and contact against the when the government tried to bring in the uh, the uh, tax yeah, the, yeah the tax the tax changes um Pierre is also a born and raised in uh, Alberta um father is a francophone from Saskatchewan uh he has represented a suburban Ontario riding for 16 years uh and he is fluently bilingual and Can fix a car with his hands out right <laughs> there's got to be a very high chance his dad was a liberal uh, yeah, I think Don probably was a liberal. Yes. Yeah. 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 Frank phones in Saskatchewan. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, and also outside of, uh, outside of, uh, outside of, uh, Jean Charest, uh, he's the most fluently bilingual person that, uh, people are talking about in the race right, right now, which okay. I think, which I think matters. I, I think we've talked about mm. this before. I think Ontario voters, uh, uh, vote for want their leaders to like Ontario voters generally want prime ministers to speak French. I think it was a problem that Preston Manning had, and our members uh, even going back. If you look at the 2000 leadership race, there was a reason why people who loved Preston Manning ended up supporting Stockwell Day because Stock could speak a little bit of a little bit of French. Right. So take away my edge, though, and 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 I and I'm not trying to be edgy, but I'm I'm actually expressing my honest yeah. opinion. Recognize the guy's talents, but I'm a bit bewildered. Do you not encounter the same reaction that I'm getting from some conservatives? Like, don't people say, come on, Jesus. I mean, the guy's the guy's a good spear carrier, but I've never imagined him as the top guy. I can't conceive of him as prime minister. Like, people don't say that? No. It's a um, – that, that role that he had, which I think for at least liberals, mm -hmm. maybe not conservatives, yes. but liberals kind of is the imprint that we have of him as the – very effective pointy edge of the stick. Yeah. Right? Um, the metaphors that occur to me, analogies that occur to me are, for instance, the Rat Pack and the Liberal Party in the right. uh, mid-80s after the crushing defeat of 84 when Brian Tobin, Don Boudria, Sheila Copps, and... Uh, um, Sergio? Was it Sergio? Was it Sergio? Or Nunziata? Nunziata. Nunziata. Oh, Christ. Anyways, Jesus. Um, we're anyway, not comparing him to Nunziata. So I'm, we're not, not comparing fair. him to Nunziata. Let's take, that, let's take that back. But even for Sheila, I mean, I think that those are sometimes defining roles that are limiting limiting roles. George Smitherman would be another example at the provincial level of somebody right. that had that job for mm -hmm. the liberals. He's he's Kenny Linsman, not Bobby Orr. Right. And, use and, a hockey match. And as a result, you, you, you never think of him in the, in the top job. So... Um, do you think that? I mean, this is an opportunity, I guess, for Pierre to show it, uh, to show that other side of yep. what he's got to. Bring. But I, I listen, and I think it's going to be interesting. I think people, um, uh, uh, people uh, who underestimate uh, Pierre would do so, uh, kind of at their at their peril. But we've talked about other politicians on the show that. Um, that played different type of roles <laughs> who have now uh, uh, who, who, who have now become uh, escalate Jason Kenney for example Jason was uh, Jason yep. was a good, was a good comparison yep Jason was a bit of an attack dog um, Jason finds yes. his political skills he's the yes. he's the premier we talked about your buddy um, uh, Marco Mendicino. Um he 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 took all the shit files for the liberals over the last four years uh, did work, and now he uh, he he is the uh, minister of yeah. citizenship. Maybe and immigration. not as abrasive as Pierre, though. Pierre's also got a bit of the yeah, like, but, but that's he's been but that's the scruffy his, edge of the uh, sponge, hasn't he? No, but this is this is the thing. We all have people in our parties that the other guys just can't stand. Justin Trudeau was that for most people in our in our party. That's we we talked about this on the podcast uh earlier. Uh, there was a, a, f a faction of our party that just could not fathom right. that this fucking guy was going to end up being prime minister cuz he, you know, he was unintelligent, he was uh goofy and all this kind of stuff. And they did our people people in our party felt that like at their own peril because yeah. he he's now a second I, I don't have Nobody in office minister. ever thinks the opposition is good That's enough right, to That's right. For sure. Uh, we did, we the, thought that Harper was do the know. job. But, but uh, I don't yeah, have you guys want it, you guys syndrome. want it, you guys just, wanted Harper to win that leadership race in 2004 against Belinda Stronick, did you not? 
No. Uh, I'm not sure. No, I always thought he was a formidable sense. opponent. Yeah. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. I always thought he was you, a You just can't opponent. conceive yourself not being in power when you're in power. You think nobody could master this incredible machine that I alone have understood. <laughs> right. But right. it's hubris. So uh, the great liberal uh, campaign guru, Keith Davey, had a maxim, which, and God, his friends that were close to him, if I get this wrong, forgive me, but I understand that he used to say that in elections you run to your strengths – and in leaderships, you run to your weaknesses. So that would that would imply that the big part of the quality of leadership campaign is not about convincing people that he's an articulate advocate of conservatism, not that he's got great organizational chops, yep. right? But that he's a prime minister in waiting, mm-hmm. right? Will we see that? Well, I think well, the, yeah, I, I think I, the argument I agree with, would, I agree with the that. The argument would be that that's the job but of that, winning. That, that's for him. kind of the argument I'm making. I, honestly, I do not. I don't have an antipathy towards a guy. He doesn't ring my bell. I'm not wound up. I'm just reflecting honestly what I think and kind of what I hear. And so, I'm I'm asking the same question: Will we see a different kind of cat in the leadership? Will he say, "Here are four important ideas that I'm going to champion as a leadership candidate"? It, listen, if uh, if Pierre runs, like you're gonna you're gonna see all this stuff come out. Uh, Come out during the uh, during the campaign, but no one's. No you one's thought gonna... of some of these things on your own, is what you're saying. You're not waiting for us to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, I, I do appreciate it. You guys are very. Uh, I mean, when well, we got, like, I, I got some idea. I got, I wrote some stuff down. Uh, I, got, I got some big right. shit. But for it's you. gonna be, right. it's gonna be an interesting race, and uh, uh, I think over the next few weeks we'll see, uh, we'll see people decide to jump in and see people decide not to. So. Okay, so one person that news is telling us is going to jump in is Jean Charest. And I will turn to you as a liberal to explain to me why he isn't the most obvious choice for this party that is looking to, A, win some more seats in Ontario by presenting a somewhat more moderate image, but the holy grail is to become competitive in Quebec, which opens up genuine majority numbers for the Conservative Party to be competitive in Quebec. Why isn't Charest the... As Brian Mulroney described, John Turner, the conservative dream in motion. I just don't get it. Um, and I know, I think, uh, I, I mean, it, it's a better question for Jenny. So I'll get, I'll be very short. To my, I, to my eyes, uh, this guy is a conservative. Um, to label him a liberal is unfair because he was forced to go to Quebec and the, the conservative or the Federalist Party and. Uh, Quebec until the CAC. That's not a fe- that's not a federal liberal party by any stretch. No, it's a federalist it. party. It was until CAC formed, and mm. and so you know, Charest is a lifelong conservative. Um, you know, he might be a red Tory, but he's a lifelong conservative. And uh, on paper, his talents and his I don't know how red he is. By the way, the Harris people ran, ran, wrote his 1997 platform for the federal campaign. Yeah, right. So that's mm-hmm. that's fair. Yeah. Um, but. Obviously, it feels to me like the modern version of the Conservative Party um, it, it has almost no interest in him. Like, uh, mm. you know, so if he's going to be a It's almost like it's a different party, Scott. It's almost almost like way. it's a different party. So, uh, and I'll shut up on this point. It seems to me that if Charest is going to run, he has to take over the party. He has to sell enough memberships that he uh, does a reverse takeover, um, maybe literally reverse in the sense that he's reversing history going back two decades. But I can't imagine that his appeal is very broad within the modern conservative party. Listen, I, 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 I've, I've said it publicly. I, uh, I think that I think the more interest in the race generally is very good for us. I think there's a there's a different feeling going into this leadership race within the party than what there was the last one. I think the issue that that a candidate like Jean Charest will have, uh, just to echo on what uh, what what Scott said, uh, is that he he has not been part of the party for 20 years. He was a provincial liberal premier who campaigned. Um, you know, against the Harper government on things like the long gun registry um, and carbon tax. And I just think it will be, I, I think it, uh, I think there will be conservatives that that will be the question that they ask, uh, they ask, they ask him. Could you sign concerning. up uh, 10,000 people and be competitive in this race? Like what, I'm trying to remember what happened in the last leadership. Like, well, what was wait, the number that Well, 10,000 is not going to do very much because no. Steve Del Duca sold 14,000 for the Ontario Liberal Party. Right, right. So, what's the number? Like, what was the number that that uh, that Andrew won with? Uh, well, on the first ballot, I'm trying to think here. On the first ballot, I think he got thirty some thousand yeah, votes. I think that's but right, it's right? so it's weighted. So, it's the same as our. Right. Is it yeah, same yeah. as our our race uh, provincially? Or uh, so 
basically each riding is worth 100 points. And so um, smaller ridings are, are no different than yep. this, no different than. So that 30,000 is 30,000 points, as I recall, right? I remember yeah. I remember covering the convention for CTV and it was. So but what that means that is, math. what that means is if you're fighting for votes in prairie ridings, yeah. you got to sell vast numbers of members memberships to overcome the existing party membership if you're trying that's, to do that. And that's why I say it would be a takeover, right? So you'd have to sell- But in Quebec, you don't have to sell 20 memberships to take over a riding. Right. Right? Well, it's, it's a classic organizational play, it's, right? It, yeah. Um, and then, listen, and that's, as, as, as teams get built and flush out, there'll be- strategies and organizers and, and and people are already giving thought to this across every campaign that I've uh, Is it a Mulroney-Harper clash? Is it a generational clash? Is it that Polyev and others in that ilk are an echo of Harper and Sheree is an echo of Mulroney and there continues to be I think we'll schism? see I think we'll see I think we'll see how the race I think I don't think there is any schism in our party. I think we'll just see how the race the race uh the race unfolds. That, listen, that's been one of the almost miraculous thing since we merged the party in 2004 is that there hasn't been internal schisms uh, in terms of what they would call different factions in the in in the party. Uh, everyone just started, you know, working together. And there's a whole generation now, people within the party that weren't like me on the reform side and and weren't like others on the on the PC side. It's a right. it's a whole generation of people that just have been the conservative party. But, of Canada. but isn't that because in this case, it isn't that the Neanderthals and the Homo sapiens are living together in peace. It's that they killed off the Neanderthals. No, we have a very vast code. Look, at, we're talking about a leadership race where, you know, we're talking about Pierre, but we're also talking about Jean Charest and Peter McKay, who's the former leader of one of those parties. Is anyone talking about McKay? McKay's talking about McKay. Okay. McKay well. is insisting that he's still a candidate, All even right. if Sheree's a candidate. So McKay was tired of people not talking about McKay. So he <laughs> got in there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still also not decided. <laughs> Teasy tease. But we should listen. You guys are in a leadership race as well. So why don't we why don't we talk about your leadership race? The Ontario Liberal leadership race, which uh, you know, for, uh, wah, wah, wah. for no kidding. I mean, for an exercise that is selecting the next leader, uh, the next premier of Ontario, potentially, it's a little quiet out there. I did. You may have noticed. Invite. The candidates to come on the Hurley Burley. And most of them said yes. Did all of them say yes? No. Uh, Michael Coto and Stephen Del Duca have not yet uh, said yes. So we'll be oh, asking them again if I they will see. come if they'll come on because you know I think that that could add a little a little energy a uh, little energy to that. So is race. it going to be Del Duca? That everyone seems to say it's it's him. But the last few leadership races, it's it's never been the front runner um, that's been elected. You guys would know better, like Lynn McLeod. Kathleen. It's a proportional representation delegated convention, which is easy to say uh, and even easier to understand. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but what it means is that um, you you can't get fifty percent of the delegates. Very very hard. Yeah, to get you more can't than 50%. consolidate your position as a front runner, but you can be rewarded as a relative small candidate um, disproportionately. So um, it creates a circumstance where it's hard for leadership candidates. Um, to lead from the front. And so the first question under this system always is, does the front runner have enough uh, to bully the way through either on the first ballot or close enough that the second ballot becomes almost a fait accompli? And I think that's what's going to be interesting because by all accounts, and I don't know, it's a bit of a black box, really. Um, we have 37,000 memberships sold, people say. But does Del Duca have enough um, as a front runner? I think he's the undisputed front runner, but does he have enough that his selection is inevitable. I think most people say no. I really don't know. Um, and so then people start to talk about, well, what would the down ballot folks do and how do they congregate? And does there become, as sometimes happens in these delegated conventions, uh, an anybody but movement against whoever the front runner is? And that's yeah. got to be the which risk I don't of your sense, Del Which I don't sense has developed yet um, in the Ontario Liberal Party and anybody but Del Duca movement. I don't, I, don't, so I don't sense that out there and I don't sense that the party will be that any elements of the party will be wildly unhappy if he doesn't win the potential cleavage that might turn it into that would be if the other candidates are able to turn it into a conservative light versus a modern progressive liberal dynamic right. right that all of them represent where Kathleen was taking the party and he represents uh, right. a, a, a more Conservative. Kind of 905 suburban, more center right. Right. Uh, so if that kind of cleavage emerges, then that might create that 
create that dynamic. When is the actual Somebody's race? Gonna have when to is be, the convention? Somebody's going to have to be stronger than I think uh, in order to beat him, I think. Right. Yeah. right? Somebody's going to have to be strong. They, it's in March. It's in March. It's in March. Okay. Here's the here's the tragedy of it. Um, I think you're right. If you look at the polls, you got to say to yourself, well, notwithstanding the size of the caucus right now and the extent of the beating that David laid on the party in the last election. Um, Thank you very much. I'll take uh, I'll take yeah. I'll take no credit for that. Um, I was right there beside David uh, in the fire pit. Um, it, it just took all of his advice. It was the worst mistake uh, I ever made. Yeah. No. I'm like, yeah. oh yeah. yeah let's, <laughs> Uh, hydro, man. Let's, let's, <laughs> like, let's lick the hydro pole. Come on. What's the worst thing that could happen? Touch the wires. Uh, Come on. Um, I, uh, I think you have to say objectively that there's a very strong chance um, that OLP would be uh, competitive uh, to win the next election. So the next leader could very well be the next premier. And so what I find perplexing, and I'll speak strictly for myself, I find it perplexing that I can't, as a lifelong liberal, as a lifelong partisan, as someone that's been involved in the provincial party as recently as like a year and a half ago, I cannot get my blood up for this race. And it's not a reflection of the candidates, know a bunch of them, but I'm just not, I can't, I don't know. I got no jazz about it. And I don't, I, it's like, how come? Well, I, I don't know. I, I, plausible I, answer for I don't know why you would feel that way because I think it's a hugely consequential decision for the party because... I think there's going to be a real desire among the progressive element of Ontario to defeat Ford in the next election. And so I think if the Liberal Party, I think the Liberal Party is the most likely vehicle for that to happen. But if we don't look like we could do it, then that group could again coalesce behind the NDP. And if we finish third two elections in a row, um, especially if the NDP were to actually win the election, it becomes very problematic. Well, math is just so underwhelming. I was going to ask you why, you I mean, you obviously ran the Ford campaign or part of it, you have a, a deep understanding of this. Why are they running behind the Liberals now that they're the official opposition, the NDP? Why are they, uh, I just why can't they consolidate their alternative positioning? Because I just don't think they, they don't seem to just have it, like they just, she doesn't seem to have it in her. Like there just seems to be um, no fight, no strategy, no um, uh, you know, they comment when necessary. They're, they're not, they don't, they, they, they don't seem to have, can get their, uh, to get, to get their sea legs. Yeah. I don't, it's just, it's, it, but, but she seems to have been like that before, like in the last, yeah. par like par parliament. Like I don't know why it would be surprising to anybody to be candid. I mean, it's not like the NDP don't have talent on their front bench, um, but, or, or available to them uh, in elsewhere, high profile new Democrats in the, the province. But Horvath has had one good day in like eight years. And it was the day of that city debate. If you yeah. Like, I mean, you have to be very versed in this stuff, but if we remember the city TV debate that happened about two, three days before the formal writ dropped, where she performed really well, and boom, uh, it sprang the NDP far ahead of the Liberals, and we could never recover from that. And that's that was the best day and the only best day she had during the election campaign. And I don't think she's had a good day since then. But I, she didn't have a shitload of good days before that yeah. either. I, 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 I'm the same. Like, I just, it, it, it's not surprising just based on the fact, like, the last, uh, the last eight years. So, they, we'll see, but. Like, how could you not be using this education scrap uh, to your complete and full advantage with the uh, New Democrats? It just boggles my mind. Yeah. No, I, I see no know. traction from them. Do you see anybody in the liberal leadership race, Jenny, that as a conservative you say, well, that person might have something that would make me nervous? Um, honestly, not re like not. Well, no one has a beard. No right? one. That's <laughs> so. First of all, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Um, listen, I think we'll have to. I think we'll. I think we'll. We'll see how they perform. I think that you guys will get to. Uh, uh, there's two by elections coming up, which you guys will get wins in. Um, in Vanier and, and Orleans, that'll give a bit of a boost to to uh, whoever gets elected uh, elected leader. Right. If we win Orleans, that would be good news. Yeah, but you're going to, it was one of the seven seats you guys won. Yeah, I know, but with an incumbent and, yeah, you know. No, I, I, I think it's zero, there's a 0% chance <laughs> that, 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 that we're, we're in play for these. Like the, if it, the, the seven, t part of seven seats that you guys kept. So <laughs> I think it's safe to say you're going to keep. You're yeah, I just, play. I don't know where our base is anymore is my problem. Listen, this has been great. Thank you very much Thank for being you. on our first one in 2020. See you back in a couple of weeks and we'll see if the government's emerged from, uh, to look at its shadow <laughs> by then. <laughs> <laughs> Till next week, folks. 
thank you everybody for coming back to listen to us again after the break. I hope you enjoyed our our chat about Canadian politics today. I would like to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and our original sponsor, Aurea, for their support of this podcast. It's essential uh, to keeping it going, and we really appreciate it. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, the folks at Air Quotes Media for their support in putting this episode together, and the people at the Orange Lounge, including Metal Donkers Good, for their help in recording this program. Uh, we'll be back next week with a very unique uh, episode uh, where two powerhouse women who fought their way up through the chauvinistic world of Canadian politics, Jenny Byrne and Pat Sorbera, are going to have a chat together uh, about what that's been like and what it and uh, what some of the hard, they're both ground organizers, what some of the realities of ground organization are, especially with leadership campaigns coming up in a couple of parties. I think it, this is going to be a fascinating discussion and I'm going to sit in just to uh, be the peanut gallery and keep them honest. So I think that's going to be a lot of fun. Tune in next week for Jenny Byrne, Pat Cerbera, and a little bit of me. Till then, bye. <laughs>